Anyway, happy times. Um, <clears throat> So today's lecture will be about biogeochemical cycles, but we're really going to start off by describing the different parts of the Earth system. Okay. Um, so really, these are the parts. Okay. So we kind of it's 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 simple for scientists to kind of like divide up a complex system into break it down into individual parts, and the Earth kind of does that quite nicely. So the atmosphere is kind of the gaseous part of the Earth, and that's quite clearly separate. Um, from uh, the rest, okay, so that you can then maybe think about dividing up the ocean, okay, into a, a separate unit. I mean, there is water in other parts. I mean, there's water in the atmosphere, there's water in the biosphere, there's water in rocks. Uh, but we like to think of maybe just, just the ocean as a, as a separate unit. Um, uh, the lithosphere, so that's the bit that's made up of rocks, and the biosphere is the bit that's made up of, of biology. So that's like soils, trees, plants, stuff that lives in the ocean. Um, there's also on here uh, the cryosphere, so we're not going to really deal with that. That's the ice part of the Earth. Um, so it does play a small role in biogeochemical cycles, uh, but it's really a very, very minor component. So we're going to ignore that. So this lecture, we're going to go through each of these components and basically describe their characteristics. And that's going to be uh, the main thing that we're going to be doing today. Okay, so the atmosphere, as we mentioned, is the gaseous part of the... Um, uh, the, the planet, so it's, uh, it's, it's evolved through time, okay, so you might have done this with Steve, I think you will have done this with Steve, uh, that its composition has changed through time, and that's mostly as a result through interactions with the biosphere. Um, it's really important in controlling our climate, so the chemical composition of the atmosphere, the, the types of gases in there, are really important for determining that um, emissivity term in the radiative balance equation, which you should all be very familiar with. Um, it says here it's well mixed, homogenous. That's mostly true of the, the bottom of the atmosphere, the bit that we live in. Uh, but as you go higher up in the atmosphere, it tends to be uh, less homogenous. It can be a little bit more stratified, hence the name stratosphere. Um, yeah, so because it's kind of well mixed, if we, if we change the composition of the atmosphere, that, that's, that's a globally relevant kind of change. Okay. Um, so to... Um, to look at the, uh, just the, 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 the compositional parts of this, so uh, the troposphere is at the bottom of the atmosphere. Now, if you look on the, this, 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 this plot here, we've got uh, height above the Earth's surface on this axis, and we've got pressure on this axis. And you can see that pressure is a logarithmic scale. Um, so this means that there's much more atmosphere in the troposphere than there is in the stuff above. It's much denser. And that's because it's got the rest of the atmosphere pushing down on it. Okay, so every time you go up in the atmosphere, the pressure goes down. So uh, most of the atmosphere is in the troposphere. Almost all of the water in the atmosphere is in the troposphere. And uh, I mentioned uh, in the uh, climate lectures that the, the troposphere was heated, or the atmosphere was heated from the ground up. Okay, because the sun's energy mostly comes through the atmosphere because it's short wavelengths, heats up the Earth's surface, and then it's that Earth's surface that's heating the atmosphere. So it's heated from the bottom, so the temperature is typically higher at the bottom than the top. That makes it inherently unstable, okay, because hot things like to rise up, which means that this part of the atmosphere is extremely convective. It's constantly kind of overturning, which is why we have lots of weather. Okay, it's also one of the reasons why this part of the atmosphere is very well mixed. Okay, so moving up uh, into the, the stratosphere. So the stratosphere, its name suggests that it's, it's very well stratified, very well layered. And that, that's a result of um, the ozone, which is uh, O3 instead of O2, uh, molecules that are in this part of the atmosphere. And these can actually absorb energy from the sun. So they can absorb the shortwave radiation from the sun. This is very useful for us because it means we don't get cancer um, from all that kind of UV radiation. It also means that this part of the atmosphere is heated from above, okay? which means that it gets warmer as it goes up. Okay? And that means that it, the, the, the top layers are less dense than the bottom layers, which keeps it kind of very well layered, which means that this part of the atmosphere is not very well mixed. So if we inject climate-relevant aerosols, for instance, from volcanoes or... or um, or flying planes, uh, we put them in the stratosphere, they tend to stay there for longer because this part of the atmosphere is more stable. There's less convective overturning in that part of the atmosphere. 
Um, and then we have these other parts of the atmosphere on the top, the mesosphere and the thermosphere. You don't really need to worry about those, but this is basically where, almost where satellites are going. So the atmospheric pressure up there is extremely, extremely low. There's, I mean, uh, quite a lot of the, the, um, the uh, gases up there are basically interacting with the solar wind. Um, they're highly ionized in a lot of cases. Um, so there is th some chemistry that goes on there that, that's important, but um, for the, for the, I guess for the, for the bulk of this course, we can kind of ignore those layers of the atmosphere. Um, going on to the chemical composition, so most of the atmosphere is nitrogen gas, so it's nitrogen triple bonded to another nitrogen, so that's an extremely stable uh, molecule, very hard to break apart. Um, the other important gases are oxygen, which is important if we like breathing, we all like breathing, um, and argon, which is a totally inert um, gas. So that's uh, just kind of left over from the, uh, the gases that were in the atmosphere at the, the formation of the Earth, um, mostly. Some of it's due to radioactive decay from rocks. Um, the other gases that are important, carbon dioxide and methane, I mean, there are lots and lots and lots of other gases in the atmosphere, uh, CFCs, organic molecules, nitrous oxides, things like that. But these are the most important for, um, I guess, this, this, this course, because uh, they are the most important in terms of the greenhouse gas effect. So they're, they're, they are radiatively important gases. You can see that their concentrations are very, very low. I should update that to say 400 parts per million, because it's, you know, 400 parts per million now. Um, and the methane is, is, also, is also quite low. Um, also, the atmosphere, as well as gases, it has these aerosols in it, which um, I guess I, I showed you this video um, last week, or maybe the week before, I can't remember. Um, so atmospheric, atmospheric consists of these aerosols, essentially dust, but the dust isn't just mineral dust like it's from the Sahara Desert. It also contains sulfates, organic compounds from forests, biomass burning, all different types of aerosols which have slightly different radiative properties. So, for instance, um, uh, organic particles from biomass burning tend to be black, so they might, may absorb more radiation coming in, whereas sulfates tend to have this cloud brightening effect, which we mentioned due to cloud condensation nuclei. So uh, the, the impact of aerosols on the climate are um, strongly dependent on their, their type okay, and their amount. Okay? Um, so that's their climatic effect, but they also have an effect on some of the biogeochemical cycles because these aerosols are made of chemicals. Okay? They are not only kind of made of stuff, but they quite often act as sites for other chemicals to attach to them and then get transported around. Okay? So it turns out that for some elements, particularly to, for instance, uh, iron and phosphorus, um, so these elements find it quite hard to get out into the middle of the ocean. So transport on dust particles from the land to the ocean turns out to be a significant source of some of these elements which are important for life. And we'll come on to that in the, in the lectures on, on phosphorus and, and um, other nutrients. So it's not just the radiative and climatic effect of these aerosols, which we've gone over. These can also be important transport vectors for key elements for life. OK, we've stuffed it up as well. So we've also got types of particles which are not natural. So from us burning stuff mostly, or kind of having farms, or driving diesel cars around Hong Kong. Um, uh, anybody been to Hong Kong? Really is like that almost all the time. It's horrible. Um, it's got, when I visited it, it's kind of like visiting the future, in that everything is modern, and lots of kind of high-rise buildings, and neon lights everywhere. And it looks kind of like you're entering this kind of futuristic modern city, and then you realize that actually the, the view of the future is horrible, because uh, it's all polluted. and. Uh, huge population density, lots massive disparity of wealth and that kind of stuff. Anyway, much of my holidays in Hong Kong, not so relevant to you. Um, right, so that was the atmosphere. I'm going to talk about the, lithos blah, 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 blah. the lithosphere, rocky part of the Earth. Um, so this is the background here is a photo from um, northwest Scotland, where I think quite a lot of you will go on a field trip to the multicoloured rock stop. This is, this is it. Um, so it's important, the lithosphere is important for biogeochemical cycling, so for, it's important for life on Earth because a lot of the elements that are essential for life ultimately come from rocks. 
Okay? So the interaction of rocks with the environment, so the, the dissolution and breakdown and release of nutrients from rocks to the environment is really important. Okay? Um, okay, so this is the bulk composition of the earth, or the crust, yeah, of, the, of the, basically the continental crust, the lithosphere. So you can see that it's mostly made up of elements, silicon, aluminium, I guess oxygen should really be on here as well, so um, I guess all of the oxygen in the atmosphere has ultimately probably come from the Earth at some point. Um, so uh, all of these other elements are also relevant for life as well. Not all of them. So things like iron, calcium, potassium, phosphorus, these are things that, that you can't function without. Okay? So if you completely removed iron from your diet, um, you would die, um, which would be unfortunate um, for you and your family. Uh, so have iron. So go and drink some Guinness. It's good for you. Uh, um, so the, the, the process which, which the, of that interaction of, of the lithosphere with the other kind of spheres in biogeochemical cycles is, is a set effectively weathering. And we've talked about this already. So there are two types of weathering. Mechanical weathering. So this is the breaking up of, of large rocks to small rocks to increase their surface area. Um, and it tend, this tends to happen in these kind of extreme environments where you've got lots of tectonic uplift, lots of steep slopes, lots of kind of surface processes, glaciers, landslips, that kind of thing, breaks up rocks into smaller parts. Um, climate has a feedback on that, so things like extreme climate systems, if you have like a really strong seasonal cycle, that might affect the amount of uh, freeze-thaw action you might have on, on rocks that, that break them apart. Um, so chemical weathering is the bit that actually does the, the releasing of the key elements from that, that rock that's been, been uh, physically weathered. Um, so it's effectively taking a nice fresh rock, kind of like this, and then and it's attacked by the environment uh, and alters the, the chemical composition of the minerals to, to make some of the, the components soluble. And that's kind of you know, really obvious. I mean, it's effectively rusting. So we're basically taking... The, the, the rocks, and, and we're rusting them, we're dissolving them, we're releasing elements from them. So you can see that kind of in limestone pavements, in statues around towns and stuff, which are being attacked by acid rain. Um, so the, the two processes, physical and chemical weathering, kind of go together. Okay, so if you don't have mechanical weathering, the rate of chemical weathering will be very low because there are no fresh surfaces to... Um, to attack. So one of the things is that a place like the rainforest, perhaps, if you go to the Amazon basin, you have lots of, it's hot, it's wet, you'd expect there to be lots of chemical weathering. But because the rate of uplift there is very slow, you're not exposing any fresh rock surfaces. So it's basically covered in very thick soil and no fresh weathering can happen. So you have to have the two, two processes going on at the same time to have your, get, your, get your stuff done if you're, if you're wanting weathering to happen. Um, so all rocks are not equal. Uh, so you, you might have seen a diagram, something a little bit like this in um, Earth Dynamics, maybe. OK, where kind of if you, if you start crystallizing out stuff from a melt, you might at high temperatures crystallize out olivine and pyroxenes. And as the melt evolves, you start to crystallize out quartz and muscovites at the end. Doesn't, if you can't remember, it doesn't really matter. But the point is that some rocks are made up of minerals like olivine and pyroxene, like basalts maybe are made up of minerals like that. And those minerals are, form at high temperature. Okay, I mean, all of these minerals fall at high temperature. They're not like hundreds of degrees Celsius. But these are kind of like at 800 and these are at maybe 400. So these, rock, these minerals that make up kind of things like granites and sandstones, they are more comfortable, they are more thermodynamically stable at kind of environmental conditions. Whereas because these minerals formed at high temperatures, that's the temperature that they're kind of stable at. So bringing them to kind of surface temperatures and pressures, they're, they're, less, they're, more, they're less stable, which means they're more easily weathered. Okay, so rock types like basalts tend to weather faster than kind of um, sandstones. Um, we've mentioned this already before, so the... the the parameters that determine how, how fast weathering happens are really temperature and water availability. So, uh, so on the vertical axis of this plot is kind of weathering rate. So the higher you go up, the more weathering you get, measured by silicon flux. So the amount of silicon being removed from every hectare of land every year by weathering. 
Um, so that goes, that increases with precipitation. So the more precipitation you get, the more weathering you get. And also, as temperature goes up, the uh, rate of uh, weathering goes up because it's a, it's a reaction rate and an Arrhenius type relationship, which you might cover with um, Brian. Okay. Um, so the amount of biology also has a, has a, has a role in this uh, as well. So um, if you've got some soil, okay, the soil will have organic carbon in it. That organic carbon will be respired by bacteria and fungi in the soil. So that will be releasing carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide reacts with water because there will be some water in the soil. And that forms these species, carbonate, car bicarbonate and uh, actually, carbonic acid should be in the middle. That's the wrong way around. But anyway, it basically, water and CO2 react together to form carbonic acid. Okay? So carbonic acid is an acid. That attacks rocks. Okay? So if you have more biological activity, that leads to increased chemical weathering. I should fix that equation. <coughs> I'm not going to fix that equation now. Um, so this is kind of what you kind of see here is that uh, uh, we've got this carbonic acid that's being formed by the soils that are overlying these kind of rocks. And you get more soil in these little kind of gullies here. And they act to enhance the acidity of the water that's, that's attacking this limestone and dissolving it. Okay? So if we look at... Uh, the rates of chemical and uh, mechanical weathering kind of, kind of continent, kind of, kind of wide. Um, so these are quite large numbers here. I'll just flick ahead to this kind of thing. So just put those on a graph. Uh, you can see that, that there's a, there is a, a correlation with, uh, so when physical erosion goes up, you tend to have higher weathering. Okay, so on the, um, it's not kind of always a one-to-one -one relationship because... Uh, so Asia has got high physical erosion, so it's got high chemical weathering, but it's perhaps not wet enough or dry enough compared to, um, say, Africa, okay, or South America, that it will enable the full extent of that, all of the physically eroded material to be chemically weathered. Um, but the, the thing to take home from this, this plot is that physical erosion and chemical weathering kind of go hand in hand. Um, you can kind of uh, see this. So this is the, um, basically a plot of where physical erosion is happening on, on Earth. You can see so the size of the arrows are the fluxes of sediment that are being taken out of rivers. So you can see the large rivers on this uh, Amazon, um, the Nile, uh, which is kind of like maybe the second largest by, by discharge of water. Uh, and you can see here that um, maybe a lot of water coming out of the Nile, but we don't have much sediment coming out of it. So there's no arrow coming out of the Nile, effectively, compared to the Amazon and some of the larger rivers over in Asia and the Philippines, which is uh, it's where Mount Pinatubo is, apparently. Um, <laughs> um, and, and the reason is that, the, that these regions where you have really high um, uh, sediment flux is because these are the regions where there's a lot of tectonic activity going on. Okay, so it's basically the link between plate tectonics kind of controls the amount of physical weathering that's going on, which also controls the amount of chemical weathering. And hence the link from the plate tectonics part of earth sciences to the biogeochemical cycles part of, of earth sciences. Okay, so the stuff you're doing in earth dynamics is really relevant to the stuff that, that we're going to be doing in biogeochemical cycles. Okay, it links the, the um, basically the, the, the geological evolution with the planet with the kind of evolution of life and sus sustaining of the, the biosphere. Okay, so there's the summary of that. It's, the lithosphere is important because the stuff we need comes from it, okay? And it comes from it through weathering. Okay, so uh, biosphere. So I mentioned at the beginning that the uh, biosphere, or the, 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 sorry, the atmosphere was, was, was reflecting some of the, the processes that happen globally and is basically the, the product of some of the, the life processes on Earth. 
So this, this little graph down at the bottom, you might have seen this in Steve's lectures. No? Uh, so this is the great oxygen, oxygenation event, which you have seen in Steve's lectures in a slightly different plot. So this is the oxygen concentration uh, on the vertical axis in percent uh, present atmospheric levels. So that's now. It's a, basically 10 to the 0 is, is 1. So that's the... Uh, times one atmospheric levels. And in the past, the oxygen concentration has been lower. At the beginning of kind of like the Earth, it was very, very low. OK, maybe uh, five orders of magnitude lower than it is today. And then there, there are some events that go on through Earth's history that have gone on to um, basically uh, raise the oxygen concentration. So basically, if we start to develop photosynthesis, so life starts to happen, OK, so that, that basically raises the oxidation state of the atmosphere to such a point that basically we get to here and we can start to have oxygen in the atmosphere. OK, and we get a sudden change. And this feeds back into the development of life as more complex forms of life can then evolve in an atmosphere or in, on an ocean which has an atmosphere that has oxygen in it because that provides a very energetic redox gradient which that life can, can use for you know, life activities. Um, the biosphere is made up mostly of the elements that you are made up of. So you are mostly oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen, mostly water and carbon, effectively. Um, and this is where those elements come from. Okay. Um, we are kind of like bits of other. So the, these other elements are also critically important for life to happen. So if we don't have... Uh, potassium, then there are, there are functions within cells which just don't work. Uh, calcium, you think, oh, well, we just need calcium for bones. So life would be fine if we didn't have bones and we were all kind of jelly-like and we'd be fine. Um, that's not true. Um, there, are, there are functions within cells, particularly to do with energy transport, okay, which absolutely require calcium. Okay, so basically the functions... Bio, the bio, biochemistry of your cells will not work without calcium. Similarly for phosphorus, magnesium, all of these things like sulfur, just life needs these kind of like minor elements, these little mostly carbon-based life forms, but without everything else, um, life would not happen. Um, so this is, this is the... Uh, who knew? Ooh, it's magnetic. Um, uh, these, are, these are some of the basically important kind of reactions. So photosynthesis, th th photosynthesis, the conversion of CO2 and water to effectively chemical energy. I say so we're taking chemical energy from, we're taking energy from, from light and we're using that to make a chemical potential energy in this organic carbon. Um, and then the process of respiration releases that chemical energy. So life can then use that chemical store of energy to grow, to do things like walk around and enjoy forests and eating fungi. Um, so this transfer of energy is sometimes referred to as primary production. So this is the, t the where you take energy from effectively the sun and you produce biomass with that. Okay, so. Uh, so the total amount of energy that's been taken out from the sun is the gross primary production. Now that's not a terribly useful um, measure because even plants need to breathe. So plants don't just do photosynthesis, they also respire because they need to use that chemical energy to do things like grow leaves, to reproduce, to whatever it is plants do. Um, so we have this term net primary production, which is the, the total amount of energy that's being kind of taken from the, uh, the, uh, the sun and converted into chemical potential energy, and that's measured in mass of bias, bio goo, kind of organic matter, minus the amount that's being given back by plant respiration. Okay, so that's this accumulated biomass okay, um, of plants. Okay, I'll just point out that uh, I do this every time, almost every time I put up those photosynthesis reactions, kind of water, carbon dioxide equals organic matter and oxygen. That is not photosynthesis. Okay, photosynthesis is much more complex than that. There are all kinds of like crazy reactions that go on. And it's also not a 
backwards and forwards reaction. Okay, so respiration is not the back reaction of photosynthesis. Okay, so you could, the, the back reaction of these is not respiration. So just bear that in mind. Um, role of temperature. So just like with, um, with weathering, if you increase the temperature, you can increase the rate of biological productivity. Okay, and that's because biological productivity is effectively just a series of chemical reactions. Okay, so the warmer it is, the faster those chemical reactions can go. Now there is a limit, so as you get too warm, you start to get thermal damage to some of the, 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 the cells and the, the, the molecules within them. So there is a kind of a limit to how high you can go with temperature to increase biological productivity. Um, but as we increase the temperature, um, net primary productivity tends to go up. Just like with water, okay, so water is a strong control on the amount of um, primary productivity because water is required for photosynthesis. Okay, so it's not quite a straight line relationship. Okay, so you, you basically, as you increase the uh, amount of water available, uh, productivity can go up, but at some point it gets so wet that it doesn't matter how much water you have. Right? It's like going to an all-you-can-eat buffet. It doesn't matter how much food is there, you can only eat so much. Okay? Well, anyway. Um, <coughs> uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> bring some more food up. Um, so, yeah, so it's not just light and uh, uh, temperature and precipitation that matter. So life, as I've already mentioned, does need some of these kind of like minor elements. So you look down the side of your multivitamin bottle that your mum made you have when you were like seven, um, and there's a whole bunch of elements on there which you must have to, to function. And that's not just true for you, but it's true of kind of all cells, really. So we need things like iron to perform... Well, so iron is, is important for, for photosynthesis... For, Iron is important, uh, manganese is important, magnesium is important. Um, so the, 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 the molecule that does photosynthesis, the thing in the chloroplast, that d can't exist without a magnesium. Okay? Um, so you need all of these minor elements. So if you don't have one of those, that can limit the amount of biological activity that can happen. Okay? And we can kind of see, see the, some of these limits coming into play here. So this is the uh, primary productivity across the globe. So you can see it covers the ocean and, and, the, and, the, and the land. So you can see primary productivity tends to be a bit lower in the ocean. Uh, but it's strongly limited by, in this case, the availability of water. So where there's no water, okay, productivity is very low. Where you have lots of water, it's very high. Uh, where you get up into the high northern latitudes, very high up here, it's dark quite a lot of the time. So that, that limits the amount of biological activity that, that can go on. Um, if we look at the marine... Oh, no, I was supposed to put a different... Yeah, so let's just flip forward to that one. So this is, this, this is the marine kind of map here. So it's the same... This is showing exactly the same thing. I've just changed the scale. Okay, so this went from 0 to 3. Now this is going from 0 to 0.5. So we can see the variability in the ocean on this one now a lot better. Um, so you can see that the, the primary productivity in the ocean is, is not, it's lower than on the land, uh, but there is more ocean. Uh, but it's also um, much more heterogeneous. Well, it's not more heterogeneous than on, la on land, but it is, it's not evenly distributed over the ocean. So there are some places along coasts, um, in regions in the Southern Ocean where deep water is brought up from depth to the surface, which also happens along the equator. So we have this distribution of biological activity that's kind of a bit patchy in the ocean. Okay? So understanding why some regions have high productivity and some regions have low is really important because that primary productivity supports the marine food web. It has important impacts on some of the other element cycles, so this, all this life that's happening in the ocean impacts the carbon cycle. So understanding why we have this spatchy pattern, so spatchy is sparse and patchy, um, we, uh, we can better understand the fluxes of maybe carbon in between the atmosphere and the ocean, which is important for the, the climate. Um, 
So if you look at the, the overall numbers, it turns out that although it's lower in the ocean, there's more ocean, um, uh, and it's kind of the, the bits of high productivity are spread more out, whereas on the land, the high productivity bits are really concentrated to the rainforests. Um, so if you look at the, the total amounts in terms of gigatons of carbon per year, out of the atmosphere, we're taking almost 100 gigatons of carbon out of the atmosphere every year. About half is from the ocean and half is from the, the, the terrestrial biosphere. So that's basically taking CO2 and stripping it out of the ocean, of the atmosphere, sorry. And also the ocean. So globally, it removes all of that stuff. Okay. So that's the production of biomass. But quite a lot of that biomass does eventually come back up into the atmosphere. So there is a return flux approximately equal to that because of the decay of um, plant matter and the animals. Uh, we also have this problem that we're constantly adding uh, carbon to the atmosphere from our anthropogenic activities, and this doesn't have a return. Okay, so with all the plant matter, we're taking carbon out of the atmosphere, but then when those plants decay, die or get eaten and respired by animals, that CO2 returns to the atmosphere. So that, that, that is roughly in balance, whereas our anthropogenic uh, emissions are not. So there's no out term. So um, although this, 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 this number of 105 gigatons of carbon per year is much, much bigger than our emissions, which are only in single digits, well, currently in only single digits of gigatons per carbon per year, uh, this is much more of a problem because this doesn't have an out, whereas the, uh, bi the bio 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 biosphere is taking it out and putting it back in, taking it out and putting it back in. Okay, so uh, the hydrosphere. Um, so these little, little blobs here, so this is, this is all the water on Earth. That's how, if we put it in a little ball, that's how much it would be. Uh, if we take all of the fresh liquid water, that would be this. So this was the, the water in rivers, in lakes, and also in um, groundwater. Uh, the amount of water that is available to us to drink is this little dot here. Okay, so it's, it's actually a very small component, even if you consider all of the water in the ocean of the whole planet. But uh, it is important because it's essential to have water for life to happen. Um, so this is where it is mostly in the ocean, as that kind of like graphic has just shown. Uh, if we look at the ocean, I've already mentioned this, that the ocean, because it's heated from the top, the sun shines down on the ocean, and also the atmosphere radiates energy downwards towards the Earth's surface. That means the surface layer of the ocean is heated up. Okay? That makes it warm and buoyant, so it kind of floats on top of the rest of the ocean. Um, so there is some mixing between the, the surface layer and the deep ocean, but it it does mean that the, the two layers of the ocean, the surface layer and the deep ocean, can sometimes be considered as separate parts. Okay? Because the surface layer is the bit that interacts with the atmosphere, it's the bit that has light, so that's the bit that life goes on in, whereas the deep ocean is much bigger, because it's much you know, deeper than light can penetrate down, um, so it, it contains different proportions of different elements. And we'll come on to that in, in the, the lectures on, on those elements. But do, do bear in mind that the surface layer is buoyant. It floats on top of the, the deep ocean and is somewhat isolated from it. Okay? Uh, the surface ocean kind of is the one that also interacts with the atmosphere, so it gets blown around a lot. So it's, it's much more well mixed than the deep ocean. Uh, and the deep ocean is only really connected to the atmosphere at the, in the high latitudes where water sinks from the surface down to the bottom. So this means that, because that's the only place on the present Earth that, that water can interact, really, between the, 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 the two layers. Yes, there is some mixing between the two layers, but most of the interactions happen at these latitudes, which means that because these places are in high latitudes, they're very cold, okay? which makes the deep ocean very cold, which is good if you want to put carbon dioxide in it, because cold water can store more carbon than, or carbon dioxide than, than warm water, but, it, but that also has impacts on how well these two layers are separated. Because the colder the bottom water is, the harder it is to mix with the surface layer. Okay, so we don't have um, much more time in this lecture to go over this concept of residence time. Um, so what I've done is I've put a video on Learn and also on, on YouTube 
of basically that goes through and explaining this concept of residence time in much more detail, going through it quite slowly, because it is quite hard to get your head around. But effectively, what residence time is, if we have any reservoir, and by reservoir I mean a component of the system which has got some stuff in it. That could be a nutrient, that could be the water itself, it could be air, it could be anything. Okay? Now, if you're constantly adding stuff to that reservoir, it will get bigger. Okay? And that's not the case in most of the kind of components of the Earth system, which means there must be something removing it. Okay? So you could think maybe, if you think of maybe salt in the ocean, we're constantly adding salt uh, dissolved in rivers, but some places in the oceans we're removing it from in evaporites. Okay? So the concentration of salt in the ocean would stay constant. So this concept of residence time is basically if you think about how long it would take if you shut down one of these fluxes to change the concentration in the reservoir or the amount of stuff in the reservoir. So if you imagine, uh, if we were just thinking about filling a bucket with water, the residence, if we imagine we don't have an output flux and we have an empty bucket, it's how long it would take for that bucket to fill up. Okay? And you can uh, uh, work that out. Okay? So you basically have the, the size of the reservoir divided by the rate at which you're adding it, okay, in kind of maybe kilogram, if the size of the ocean was in kilograms and the, the flux was in kilograms of water per year you were adding to the ocean, uh, then the residence time would be the number of years it would take to fill up the ocean. So this works with, on that simple example, but it importantly also works with concentrations. So if we think about if we were to double the concentration of an element being added in rivers, how long would it take for the concentration of the ocean to double? Okay, if, we, if we're thinking of those terms. And this is important because for some elements, it takes a really long time for this to happen. So it doesn't matter what we change in terms of the river flux or the output flux. An output can be all kinds of ways of taking things out of the ocean. So for instance, calcium gets taken into the ocean, dissolved in rivers, but it gets removed by the formation of things like coral reefs and shells and foraminifera. Okay, that takes calcium out of the ocean. So if you change one of those two processes, how long does it take for the concentration to change in the reservoir? And we can, we can do kind of sums to work this kind of stuff out. So just for the water, okay, so we work out the total amount of water in the ocean is 1.37 times 10 to the 21 kilograms of water, which is a big number. Uh, and the amount that's added from rivers, okay, so there's also rain that falls into the ocean, but, you know, approximately 3.5 times 10 to the 16 kilograms of water per year. Okay, also a big number. One divided by the other tells us that approximately 40,000 years is the residence time of water in the ocean. That kind of means that the average time any one particle of water that enters the ocean, that's how long it would take for it to come out. Now, some might come in and out straight away. Some of it might get stuck down in the deep ocean for much longer. Um, but uh, but 40,000 years is basically the time it takes for the ocean to kind of renew itself with, with I wouldn't say fresh water, but it's you know, with water that's not been in the ocean for a while. So you can do the same thing with stuff that's dissolved. So with, with chlorine, the, con the concentration of chlorine in seawater is 2%, 1.9%. .9%. Um, and in river water, it's five milligrams per litre, so five parts per million. Um, so we can work out the total amount of chloride in the ocean. So that's the mass of the ocean times the concentration. Mass of the ocean times the concentration. Uh, and the flux is the, the flux of water, which is this 3.5 times 10 to the 16, um, times the concentration. Okay? And because... Uh, because chlorine is very soluble in the ocean, it's got a much higher concentration in the ocean than it does in the water coming in. So that means that uh, the residence time is extremely long. So that doesn't matter. If we started just dumping salt into the ocean, if we mined out all of the salt we could find, started putting it in the ocean, it would take a ridiculously long time for us to change the concentration. Okay? So um, some of these things are the, uh, the elements in the ocean... And if we look at some of them, uh, so the chlorine, okay, so this is the concentration, 
um, in parts per thousand. So that's what that weird percent symbol means. Instead of parts per hundred, it's parts per thousand. Um, some of the residence times. So chlorine, sodium, really long residence times. Really, really long. Uh, whereas some of the other elements, okay, that even you think are very similar in their chemistry to sodium chloride, like calcium, they've got a much shorter residence time because the fluxes in and out are proportionally larger compared to their concentrations. So it means that the elements with a very long resonance time, everywhere you go in the ocean, their concentration will always be the same. Okay? Because it takes such a long time for any process to change that concentration. So these elements are sometimes called bioinert, okay? which is a really bad term because they're absolutely fundamental to life. It would, life would not be able to survive without these elements, but biology can't act fast enough to change their concentrations in the ocean. Okay? Because on the time scale of the ocean it takes to mix, okay, which, um, which, is, which is basically how long, basically how, how fast the ocean circulates around, that's shorter than the, the residence time. Okay? If the residence time is shorter than the amount of time it takes to mix up the ocean, then you can, you can get concentration variations. Um, so these are some examples of actual profiles of those. So you can see that there is actual variation of some of the elements as you go down in the water column. And this is not because we're changing the amount of that element in the water. It's because we're actually changing the amount of water. So by evaporating the water, you remove water. You make the, 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 the sea more salty. That increases the concentration of these elements. So what's the key point is that it's not necessarily the concentration that stays constant. It's the ratio of concentrations to other elements. So all of the bioinert elements should have the same ratio. So if we took chlorine, that's got the same concentration profile as potassium. Okay, so if we did the chlorine to potassium ratio, that would be the same everywhere in the ocean. Okay? And it's also kind of true for some of the less concentrated elements, so things like uranium and cesium okay? tend to be uh, bioinert-like in their profiles. But if we look at elements which are used at a faster rate compared to their concentration in the ocean, so some of the key nutrients, phosphorus, nitrous, and silicon, these are taken out of the ocean so much more quickly than their concentration in the ocean kind of, uh, um, kind of compared to chlorine and, and sodium, which means that biological processes are able to alter the concentration of these elements in, in water, which means that in places like the surface ocean, where life is happening, because that's where the light is, because it's near the, near the, near the surface, the, these elements, phosphorus, nitrogen, and silicon, can be removed from the water by life. It goes, oh, I need some phosphate to make my cell walls. And it goes, yunk, and kind of like puts that phosphate into its cell walls. And then that cell kind of dies, sinks to the sea floor. And that means you've removed phosphorus from the surface ocean, which means we can change the concentration of those elements. Um, so for these kind of things, we, we nutrient-like elements, so things like phosphorus, nitrogen, but also things like iron, barium, they tend to have these profiles where the surface concentration is low. Okay? And that's because the, the reservoir in the, of the surface ocean compared to the deep ocean is quite small. Okay? So the amount of nitrate or amount of element in that, in that part of the ocean is low. And also the, the rates of processes, the rate of addition and removal, are quite high. So they have, the surface ocean has a shorter residence time than the deep ocean. Okay? The, so you, you, quite often, you can sometimes think of the ocean as the whole and calculate its whole residence time. But you can also split it up into the surface ocean and the deep ocean. So the surface ocean has a much shorter residence time, so you can see much bigger concentration variance in the surface than the deep. And this is particularly important because if you reduce the concentration of these elements to zero, it means life can't use them because they're not there. So the abundance of life in the surface ocean is kind of self-limiting because it uses up all the nutrients, those little beasties, they fall out to the bottom of the, the ocean, removing the nutrients from the surface, and then no more life can happen there. Okay, so this, this relationship between how the concentrations vary in the ocean and the amount of life that can happen is really important. And here endeth the lesson. Um, so um, there's some summary. I think it's in your notes. Um, if you could fill out the, the feedback, key, start, stop, continue things. If you've not done it, it doesn't, you know... I won't hate you forever. Um, don't write your name on it. That would, that would be, well, you can write your name if you want to. Um, and can you put it in that cardboard box?
as you leave. That would be great. Um, so, uh, watch the videos. So there's uh, the, the feedback video from the exam, and there's also a video that if you didn't quite follow that explanation of residence times, because I went through it quite quickly, I put a much longer video where I go through it a little bit more slowly, and there's some fluffy dogs in it. Um, you'll enjoy it. Okay? Great. Um, I'll see some of you on Tuesday. Yeah.